Good evening, listeners. It's Owl Stretching Time. And now, here's your host, Frank Macaluso. Thank you, Isaac. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning into our season premiere. Whoa, Frank, you look tired. And it's only the beginning of the semester. I mean, I know theater kids party a lot, it's but... It's not that. And no, we don't. If we do, I never get invited. It's this one family that lives near campus, the Crenshaws. Crenshaw? They're real? And how. I thought they were just some phony scapegoat that underclassmen used to try and hide their hangovers. Nope. They're real. And you would not believe what went on at that house last night. Rebecca, would you get off my back? What in the burning hell possessed you to use my best pearl necklace to snake the drain in the bathroom sink? You kept nagging me to take care of that sink, and when I do it, it's not good enough for you. I get no respect in this house. Why don't you run to your little harlot then, that little Sylvia girl with the gauges? Oh wait, you can't. Shut up, shut up. What was the name of the guy she ran off with? I said shut up! And then ran her over with his Hummer before eloping with her floozy of a cousin in Tijuana. You're killing me, Beck. You are slowly but surely ripping me to pieces. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. I- Not now, Luke. Adults are talking. Don't you ever bring her up again, you hear me, Beck? Last time I checked, we still have free speech in this country. I'll talk about whatever I want to talk about. Mom! Dad! Will you please listen to me? Shut, Shut up, up Lucas. Lucas! What in tarnation is going on in there? What are you two dillweeds fighting about this time? Stay out of this, old man. This is between me and Kevin. Don't you dare talk to my dad like that, you harpy. He shot down 20 Nazis during D-Day. I can defend myself, son. Thank you very much. Shut up, you senile nerf herder. And go back to bed. If we're all lucky, maybe you'll die in your sleep. I faked all my orgasms. Ah, go. Wait, what? I can't feel my duodenum and I'm scared. Just go back to bed already. Sir, yes, sir. Mom, Dad, listen. I've got something very important to tell you, and it can't wait because she'll be here any minute now. Who's she? Oh my god, he's invited a girl over. My little boy's becoming a man, oh! It's not that, Mom. I'll never be a grandmother. Well, who exactly is coming over? It's my drama teacher, Miss Gonzalez. What the hell is she coming here for? Isn't she supposed to check with us before she comes barging into our domicile? Well, she did call, but neither of you were home. Grandpa answered the phone, though, and he said it was okay, and that he'd tell you. Did he? No, he didn't. Dad, get in here! I'm coming, I'm coming, don't get your socks in a twist. Alright, now what's all the hubbub? Did you get a call from one of Luke's teachers saying that she'd come over tonight and talk to us? I do not recall. Oh wait, I did. Why didn't you tell me? Rip, don't hit or yell. You're lucky you're old and defenseless, otherwise I'd kill you right now! If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you could possibly imagine. That's her. I'll get the door. She's here already? And my hair's such a mess. It's nothing compared to the rest of you. You'd better not talk to me like that in front of Lucas's teacher. I'll talk however I wanna. Last time I checked, we still have free speech in this country. Good evening, Miss Gonzalez. Hello, Luke. Please come in. Thank you. These are my parents. How do you do, Miss Gonzalez? Please, call me Dahlia. All right, Dahlia. And that's my grandpa. How do you do? Nook nerf! I think it's time for bed, Grandpa. But I'm not tired! Go to bed, now! Fine. Okay, let's cut to the chase. Why are you here? Dad, would you like something to drink, Miss Gonzalez? No, thank you, Lucas. Answer my question. What the hell are you doing here? What do you want? I just wanted to talk to you about how Lucas is doing in class. He's not failing, is he? Oh, no. Thank God. I know how much he loves doing theater. I'd be absolutely devastated if he were failing. Climb up, Beck, and let the woman talk. I just wanted to be sure he was doing well. 
He should have at least one supportive parent. I'm supportive. Oh, please. When was the last play he was in that you actually went to see? I support my son. I do not support his sissification. Dad, please. Stay out of this, Luke. It doesn't concern you. But I bought him action figures and a football when he was little, but does he go for them? No. He'd rather play dress up with Mackenzie and Marianne. Mr. Crenshaw. I'm getting the sense that you resent Lucas's interest in pursuing a career as an actor. Bullseye! Give the woman a cigar! I assure you, Mr. Crenshaw, that your son's desire to be an actor does not make him any less of a man. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. A gay man's just as much of a man as a straight man. I just want what's best for my son. You've seen the world out there, or are you too busy frolicking around in that little college bubble of yours? I've seen what people are like out there in the real world, and the best thing for my son is for him to be straight! Do you honestly think that all men who work in theater are gay? Not all of them, but I don't like the odds. Look, if your main concern about Lucas's dream is what it means about his sexuality, then you'll have to talk with him about that. I'm not gonna waste my breath on a bigot. Oh, look, the liberal- Let me finish! Your son has genuine talent and a lot of potential, but he also, for some ungodly reason, wants you to be proud of him. And he never feels that when he acts because there's always a voice in the back of his head telling him you would rather have him be a doctor or an engineer or something manly like that. He's told me. I figure you should know that. Get out. Kevin. I'm not going to have some acting teacher telling me how to raise my kid, and I'm certainly not going to tolerate being guilt-tripped into letting my son throw his life away. Mr. Crenshaw. Out! I'm sorry, Lucas. Get out before I call the cops. Good night, Mrs. Crenshaw. Good night, Miss Gonzalez. Go to your room, Lucas. Dad. Now! Your mother and I need to talk about something. Now go to your room. I want him out of that college, Beck. Kevin. We're spending all that money, and all we're getting is our son's head filling with garbage. Acting. Bullcrap. I know what's best for my son. I can try getting him a job at a loading dock or something. Make him into a proper man. You've never even seen him act. Every show he's been in, I've watched. Every single one he's been in since his freshman year of high school. While you were out chasing skirts, I was watching him do something he really loved. You should have seen his first show. He wasn't all that good, but he was more alive then than I'd ever seen him before. He belonged up there, and every year after that, he got better and better, and he belonged up on that stage more and more. I'll be damned if I let you take this dream from him. He's staying in college, and I'm putting my foot down. You? Ha! I'm not sure if you know this, but I wear the pants in this family. You want to wear the pants in this family? Be home on time. Spend time with our son. Talk with him like Miss Gonzalez said. Until then, I make the decisions around here that affect his life. And I say he stays in college. Where are you going? Out. Sylvia have a sister? Shut up. I'm just going down to LSB. Don't bother coming home. I know what you're really after when you go down there and it's not beer. We'll talk about this later, when I get back. There's no point. My mind's made up. So's mine. Oh, just go. Fine. And now, as a reward for all our long-time listeners, here is the sound of Donald Trump being strangled. It's, it's just a shame the way the, the liberal fake news media is so keen on attacking me. It's just so, so sad. It Thank you, and now it's time to pay another visit to Mindy Juarez as we observe the darkness in Decatur. When we last left Decatur, young Mindy Juarez, a popular radio personality and aspiring actress, was still cleaning up after her New Year's Eve party. Ugh, what a mess. I've been at this for a whole month now and I still can't see the floor. That's the last time I ever invite a political science major to a party. Oh, for the love of... What a wrong time to have a visitor. Coming! 
It's my younger sister, Isabella. What are you doing here? Don't you have school? I'm in no state of mind to go to school, Mindy. Gracious! What's wrong? Well... I've got this horrible song stuck in my head. I can barely think with it bouncing around in my head. Oh, goodness. What song is it? Some dumb bubblegum pop song Mom's been playing over and over again for the last two months. I recorded it on my phone. Listen. such a terrible song. It is to me. And mom's been playing that non-stop for two months now? What do you think she's doing that? Who cares, Mindy? Just help me get this song out of my head. Okay. Well, I'm not sure how you would get a song out of a person's head. I'll get it. But Mindy! Wherever it is, I can't leave them out there in the cold. They can get frostbite. It's Clara Hightower, Decatur's biggest gossip and part-time llama washer. Mindy, you will not believe what I just heard about Grace Piper. Yes, I will. She already told me last week about our new puppy. Oh. Well, I also have this bag of Tangelos we can split. Yay, Tangelos! Hey, Isabella, do you want some? Cada vez que quiero yo abrazarte Uno, dos, y tres, de ten, de. Whoa, what's her deal? Oh, the poor thing got a song stuck in her head. It won't leave. I have no idea how to help her. I know a guy who might be able to help. Let me call him up real quick. Hello? Clint? It's Clara. Listen, I have a friend who's in dire need of your services. What's that? You'll be here right away. Splendid. Thank you so much. Goodbye. That was fast. He used to work for Jimmy John's. What was that all about? The writer stole that joke from somebody. Oh. Well, then you'd better get the door. Clint is not the most patient of men. All right. Hello. You're Clint, yes? Well, I'm not the good humor man. All right. Where's the little lassie that needs my help? Over there, on the couch. My God, are you ever a wreck? Si me dices que no, de nuevo mi amor muy lejos me iré. Ah, so that's the song, eh? It's a neat little ditty. There's an English version too, you know. Oh, Clint, do you think you can cure her? I've tussled with earworms far slimier with a much stronger grip than this. I'm gonna need some portable speakers. I'll go get mine. Don't worry, Isabella. This will all be over in no time. I hope so. I'm starting to see traffic lights. Here you go, Clint. Great. Let's get down to business. What are you going to do? The only way to drive an earworm out is with an even bigger earworm. You might want to cover your ears. This is going to get pretty loud. <laughs> I think it worked. I can't even remember the other song. Oh, how wonderful! Oh, Clint, how can we ever repay you? I charge ten fifty an hour. But you weren't here for a whole hour. Na 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 late at night. No, but I will be. Oh no! Will Clint help Clara get that song out of her head? Will Mindy have to pay for more than an hour's service? And what of Isabella? Will her family ever discover that she secretly wears women's undergarments? All these and many other questions will be ignored completely by the next installment of Darkness Indicator. We will now pause for station identification, followed by a message from one of our sponsors. 
listening to WJMU, 89.5 The Quad. You owned your car for four years. You named it Brad. You loved Brad. You two had been through everything together. Two breakups, three jobs, Brad's mom dying. Then you caught Brad in bed with another woman. After everything you did for him, all those nights you spent wiping away his tears, calming him down after his panic attacks, helping him take care of his mother before she died, and she never liked you. She made that perfectly clear every time she could, so you did the only reasonable thing. You drove Brad off a cliff. That cheap red-headed floozy can't put you back together again, can she, Brad? Can she? <laughs> I love you, Brad. Please wake up. I, I didn't mean to hurt you. Please don't leave me. Wake up. Damn it, wake up. Cut, cut, cut. Look, Linda, this is an insurance commercial, not some off-off Broadway one-woman show, okay? Just stick to the script and then we'll have world peace, capiche? Sorry about that. Whatever. Let's just go from the last line so we can all go home already. And go. And then Liverworth Mutual calls, and you break out into your victory dance. Was that good? Yeah, sure. Do you want another take? I can do another take. Nah, we'll just fix it all in post. If you sign up for superior car replacement, we'll pay for a car that's a model year newer with 10,000 fewer miles than your old one. Liverworth stands with you. Brad, all the stupid, cheesy commercials I've ever done. And we're back. It's time now for a look at the hot-button issues affecting the world today on Roundtable. Good evening and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Michael Kilgallen, just slowly waiting for my congenital heart defect to finally kill me. On the panel tonight, we have developmental psychologist Dr. Harrison Corman, Congresswoman Maxine Waters of California, right-wing radio personality Dick Pickford, and a puddle of primordial ooze. Not much difference between the last two there. Anyway, tonight's topic is Sesame Street, beneficial children's television show or corrupter of our youth. Oh my goodness. If I may be so brazen, Mr. Kilgallen, this is probably the stupidest topic we've had on this program. Well, don't look at me. I don't pick the damn things. Be honest now. When did you stop caring about this show? About the second or third time you-know-who appeared on the panel. Hey, I think Corman's annoying too, but I try you, and be- You, Pickford, I'm talking about you! Well, I am shocked. Oh, shut up. Just let me get on with this so that we can all go home and forget this ever happened. Congresswoman Waters, since you're the new kid on the block, how about you go first? Thank you, Mr. Kilgallen. Now, Sesame Street has been around for almost 50 years, and throughout its 50 years, it has continuously evolved to meet the needs of the younger generation. Well, personally, I think it's disgusting Excuse me, Mr. Pickford. I hadn't finished talking. You said enough to fill a landfill. It's time for the truth now! Regardless of whether or not you agree with me, Mr. Pickford, I expect you to show me the same kind of respect you would want shown to you. Big mistake, lady. Dick Pickford doesn't know the meaning of the word respect. I do so! Why did you interrupt me then? Because I know exactly where you were going to go with that changing with the times jazz. You're just trying to sugarcoat the fact that Sesame Street was, is, and always has been nothing but communist, globalist propaganda meant to turn our children into entitled, delusional freaks. I mean, monsters are not real. They're not real. Elmo's not real. Grover's not real. Cookie Monster is not real. They're puppets, but our children are being deceived into thinking these are actual living creatures! Shut up, Pickford! Cookie Monster is real! Right, Miss Waters? The madness begins. Mr. Pickford, you are clearly underestimating the intelligence of the youth of this nation. Our children know the difference between fiction and reality. Like you would remember what it's like to be a kid. The last time you were a kid, the Mayflower landed at Plymouth Rock. Insults are not going to help your case. I don't need help for my case. My case is rock solid. My case is strong and durable, made of the finest American-made material. You know, you're really starting to piss me off, Pickford. Well, I think it's about time we started wrapping things up. Primordial Ooze, we haven't heard from you yet tonight. Any thoughts on the matter? My mother was a saint! Take that! Ow, my knuckles! Dr. Corman, any final thoughts? 
the Cookie Monster's real, right, Michael? And Elmo and Grover and Telly? Oh, screw it. From all of us here on Roundtable, I'm Michael Kilgallen. Good night. Ugh, I need a drink. And now, folks, something I'm sure at least some of you have been waiting for. It's time now for Farnsworth's Fables, written and narrated by Reginald Q. Farnsworth. Thank you, Frank. I hope you all enjoyed your holidays. Tonight, for your entertainment, I'd like to present to you my adaptation of that ageless classic, The Three Little Pigs. Our story begins, as it usually does, in the forest, where a big ferocious wolf lives. One day, three young pig siblings moved into the forest. This irked the wolf, who hated pigs with a passion. For some reason... Oh, I hate pigs! They're disgusting and filthy and they bathe in the mud! What a disgusting species! Why can't we get more respectable animals in this forest? Like cats or lemurs? Hello, Mr. Wolf. I'm Patrick. These are my siblings. Percy and Paula. Hi! Howdy. Go away, you filthy vermin! Go back to where you came from! We can't. We were chased from our old home by a big bad stork. And before that, we were nearly burned alive by a big bad koala. And before that, we found ourselves on the run from a big bad caterpillar. What's so bad about a caterpillar? He turned me into a newt! A newt? It got better. Well, I don't care! I want you out of my patch of the woods, and I want you out now! Mr. Wolf, what is going on here? Ah! Mayor McBunny! Are you harassing these poor unfortunate refugees? Perish the thought, Mayor! I merely informed them that their kind is not welcome here. Mr. Wolf, you should be ashamed of yourself. That is not the sort of behavior we condone here. All are welcome in this neck of the woods. Welcome, my poor scene brethren. From here on out, you are our kin and we are yours. If you ever need anything, you just need to ask, and we shall provide as best we can. Thank you, Mayor McBunny. I think we're gonna like it here. And so, the three pigs made themselves at home by, well, making themselves homes. Percy, the youngest, made his house out of straw. It's plentiful and malleable. And besides, I've got to put my weaving skills to use somehow. Patrick, the oldest pig, made his house of sticks. It'll be like living in a log cabin. Except... Not really. I didn't think this through very well. And Paula, the middle pig, made her house out of bricks. She also installed an alarm system with beam motion sensors. Getting turned into a newt does things to you, man. Yes. Well, anyway, while the pigs built their houses, the horrible wolf began to plot to remove them from the woods. How the hell can I rid the woods of those porcine parasites? There must be some way that won't involve me getting my hands dirty. Aha! Hitman! No, that's no good. They'll inevitably trace the killings to me, even if I killed the Hitman to ensure his silence. I mean, he'd probably have a family and they'd wonder where he disappeared to and that would leave them to me. Ugh, there must be some legal way to get rid of them. Oh, wait! Legal! Laws! I'll change the law, but how? There's an election coming up. <laughs> I know! I'll run for mayor! And once I win, I'll change the law to ban pigs from the woods! It's brilliant! And so the wolf began his campaign. I vow that once elected, I will do all that I can to make our patch of the woods as great as it was in days past. The first thing we need to do is rid the woods of pigs. Why? What's wrong with the pigs? Yeah! I'm glad you asked, my turtle friend. I'm not your friend. You know what? You don't get an explanation. Get that guy out of here. Go on, get him out of here. Hey, let go of me. You can't silence me, wolf. Oh, yes I can. Guards, silence him. Duh, which way did he go, George? Which way did he go? Anyway, as I was saying, pigs! They're disgusting. They bathe in the mud and eat filth. Their entire life cycle consists of nothing but eating and sleeping and mating and sleeping and mating and eating and mating! They come into our forest. They leave money tracks and droppings all over. Some, I assume, are good people. But we can't risk that. Not now! 
Mr. Wolf, what makes you think you'll be a better mayor than your opponent? Look, I love Mayor McBunny, but she can't be trusted. She's a rabbit, and everyone knows that rabbits have very poor stamina. Me, on the other hand, I have very good stamina. I have the best stamina in all the woods. I once went to the west side of the woods and caught 329 squirrels. Every last one of them I caught and killed myself. That was you? You killed my entire family, you bastard! Revenge! Guards, uh, take care of her. I am the Lizard Queen! Election day came, and the wolf lost by 30,000 votes. Big deal, so I lost the popular vote. I can still win through the Electoral College. Actually, Mr. Wolf, this is only a mayoral election. There is no electoral college. Damn, stupid proper democracy. Screw it, I'll just have to get rid of them myself. So the wolf ran straight to Percy Pig's house and knocked furiously on his door. Little pig, little pig, let me in. Who is it? You're supposed to say, not by the hair on my chinny chin chin. But I just shaved. I don't care, just say it. Who are you anyway? It's Mr. Wolf. Now say the line. I don't wanna. Fine. I'll just tell people you said it after I've killed you. Well, whatever for your What? I'm gonna huff. I'm gonna puff. And I'm gonna blow your house down. <laughs> And Percy's house came down around him. Luckily, straw is light, and Percy was able to make a quick escape. He ran straight to his brother Patrick's house. Patrick! Patrick! What's the matter, Percy? That mean old wolf is trying to kick my butt! Oh, shnikes! Quick, get in! Where's that damn pig? Hark! A nearby house made of sticks. No doubt he's in there, perhaps being harbored by a relative, most likely his eldest brother. <laughs> little pigs, little pigs, let me in. Beat it, you big dumb wolf. We don't like you. And neither of us have beards, so we're not going to do that line you want us to do. Yeah! Ugh. Why do they always want to do this the hard way? <clears throat> falling down around them. Fortunately, Percy and Patrick were not injured and made a quick escape to their sister Paula's house. What's the password? Swordfish? No, I got tired of that. I changed it. What's the password now? I can't remember. Is it Danielle Andrade? That's so stupid, it must be it. What's the dealio? Mr. Wolf just blew our houses down and now he's trying to kill us! Quick, come in! Why exactly is Mr. Wolf trying to kill you? Maybe because we didn't vote for him. I think he's just angry. Little pigs, little pigs, let me in! Up yours, Wolf! You little swine! I'm gonna kill you! Kill you! Dead! As he might, the wolf could not blow Paula's house down. Fine! I guess I'll have to do this the old-fashioned way. The wolf decided to try to break the door down. He made a running start and then... I knew that electrocute anybody who tries to break down your door security option would come in handy. And so, the pigs continued to live happily ever after in the woods, never again to be bothered by any prejudiced windbags like that horrible old Mr. Wolf. And so ends our story for this evening. A saccharine ending for sure, but I liked it. It's wish fulfillment, I suppose. Anyway, good night. Thank you, Mr. Farnsworth. And so we come to the end of another episode of Owl Stretching Time. We hope to be with you all again, same time next week. Until then, good night and be safe. That was Owl Stretching Time, starring Frank Macaluso, 
Brian Barker, Emily Bowes, Erica Caruso, Aria Hawkins, Melissa Kumro, Yaseline Overa, Michael Santos, and Antonio Verdera, with Megan Pender. This episode was written, directed, and produced by Frank Macaluso. The script advisor was Emily Bowes. This is your announcer, Isaac Weezer, speaking. Soul appeal, 